scorched earth and EMP distorting Godzilla style logos. Plus three big steps and a roar is about as classic as Godzilla gets. <laughs> Not the worst idea to remind us of arguably the best scene from 2014 in the opening of this one. And this little jaunt through the streets lines up with what Ford witnessed after that jump. Wave of mutilation checks out for Titanverse. Pixies? Yes, sir. Apparently, Rick Stanton is loosely based on Rick Sanchez. Are you sure he's gonna be okay? He is in the safest place that he could be right now. You could comfortably assume this is about Mothra waking up, but once you know the truth, you realize these reactions are about their plan to save the world. It's gonna be okay. You can take it from here once you get some rest. No way. Just a fraction of a percent of credit for trying to convince Eleven's cool nerd teacher to not be there when the activists show up. They're like environmental rest. activists, right? Who murder people? I mean, the rest of them are clearly expendable. Mothra. In gritty, realistic reboots, they like to often just dance around names because the names are the cheesiest part about whatever the fantasy is. I really enjoy that they don't shy away from these creatures' Toho-given names. Yuji Koseki's classic Mothra melody line being hinted at. I don't like to give this win to such terrible people but Charles Dance just enters the room like a badass bad guy. What we are witnessing here... What we're witnessing is a professional film crew getting footage of this battle with creative mode on. More importantly, who knew Richard Hendricks could grow such a beautiful beard? Which of these titans are here to threaten us? And which of these titans are here to protect us? Tough questions. And with a brand new Verizon phone and the largest, most... So you'd want to make Godzilla our pet? No. We would be his. Optimism and honesty. Optim honesty. Titan reproduction. I think this is the one where the genitals are blurred out. <laughs> Wait, so we were subjected to the uncensored version in the first movie without even knowing it? Hmm, where have I seen that house before? And for that matter, this girl? I just I have like 3,000 questions. You could somehow replicate the biosonar the Titans used to communicate. I know what the hell it is. I helped build a prototype. Even Coach Sonic Taylor hates exposition. Big fan of your wife's work and you. <laughs> Thomas Middleditch will always make me chuckle. Endearing awkwardness personified. <laughs> Rather than Latin, we get official Japanese names since they were discovered slash created in Japan. Good stuff. Nessie? Yeah. Good thing you're not near Japan. You thought three heads were bad. But Emma and I believe some are benevolent. Don't kid yourself. Those are two perspectives that perfectly align with the character's experiences. Sarazawa watched Godzilla defeat the threat in 2014, the Mutos, and then take a dip in the ocean. Regardless of the reason, that was net positive and could be interpreted as benevolence. Mark lost his son, and that's all that really matters. We're also given the scene of wolves eating an elk. The idea of benevolence in the animal kingdom among predators is sort of moot to Mark. There are always exceptions, but by and large, animals aren't doing much that doesn't serve the sole purpose of their survival. Hannibal King work down here now? Trafficking in a new and dangerous market. Titan DNA. Oh, so he's Hannibal King. A former British Army colonel turned eco-terrorist. Ah, there it is. Activist, terrorist. Who could keep track? Why would they want just this one when they've got the keys to your entire magic kingdom of horrors? A few Disney execs just made some nice bonuses. Do they use Titans? Once you've seen them bust through the wall and start eating your family- Oh, you mean the kaiju. You could really start to feel bad for these scientists, but you, you know what they say. A lion doesn't concern himself with the opinions of a sheep. Mother of God. She had nothing to do with this. Which, even a person who believes in God shouldn't be offended since King Ghidorah aimed from Earth. An intruder! Get her! Bad girl twist shadowing. Maser cannon. What's with the light show? It's an intimidation display. Like a gorilla pounding its chest. Eliza would know all about the habits of underwater creatures. Ooh, his eyes glowing for a stunning shot. <laughs> then just a reminder of who's king. Show me his territorial routes. What? Well, why? Because I want to start a boat tour. Just show me. There are lines you, you just have to assume Kyle Chandler came up with on the spot because if that wasn't a Coach Taylorism. What's in Antarctica? Do you see? Do you see now, Mark? Tywin needs them alive, or at least Emma, so why would he use them as human shields? It actually looks like he's trying to pull them through and he'd know that not only are they friendlies, but Emma is just as valuable to Monarch as she is to him. Mark knows his family will be safe, so it's considerate of him to come back for the soldiers. Yeah, that's an entrance. You don't really need to do anything when you look like that. <laughs> the middle head nudged the others as if to say, Guys, you're not seeing the big picture here. Saving your dad. 
Love this implied hierarchy with King Ghidorah's heads. Middle dude is clearly in charge. In addition to writing some epic Godzilla orchestral music, our composer, Bear McCreary, also used Japanese Buddhist monks chanting for a few of Godzilla's entrances. Never expected a wide shot to reveal Godzilla as the little guy. We've seen it before, so no holding back. Oh, we missed! And King Ghidorah returns fire with his own mouth blast thing. Gravity beams, whatever. Escalation. The Mutos were a joke in comparison. <laughs> okay, yeah, he's a threat. Eliza's green water monster couldn't save her this time. And all in all, this battle is in the same vein as the first movie. It's dark, snowing, muddled, and Ghidorah bails before it gets too messy. Overpopulation. Pollution. War. The mass extinction we feared has already begun, and we are the cause. As a person who knows anthropogenic climate change is a real problem, this is just... Is anyone not rolling their eyes? Propaganda is propaganda. We don't have giant monsters to save us. But she's basically advocating for a plague. Emma is Thanos with less empathy. At least he stopped at half. She just wants to drop a nuke on each continent. I'm not taking a win off because it still works in the movie universe and living in peace with creatures that were here first and do show signs of benevolence is significant. It makes her a sympathetic villain even if she's advocating for the genocide of billions. K kinda like Thanos. Zhang Zi is always a win. Emma, you came to me. That's the real freaking twist. Right up until this moment, even after her FaceTime confession, you could probably convince yourself that she was just being manipulated, but now we know she went to him? Eesh. At least let them get to safety. This is bigger than just you and me. And that's like the perfect expression of Maddie's level of understanding and, by extension, complicity. Not sure it even occurred to her that billions had to die for this plan to work. Roden, the fire demon. It's comforting. Another correctly named kaiju that lives up to his namesake in this incarnation. You don't even consider the wake these giants leave when they fly. That means it's coming for food, a fight, or a forecast. Yeah, that's some severe weather. Eek, no ejecting from that. Pretty brutal. <laughs> Not that it matters. That's terrible. And some ingenuity from the fire demon. I'm not sure that's any better. Pretty rare that you get to see monster fights between two winged kaiju actually up in the air. Oh god. Zilla. And then an underwater battle where the winged one is clearly at a disadvantage, ending it with a head rip off. Yes. You get the feeling Lefty is always the one to lose a head first? Poor guy. There's the yup shot. Another Torterra? You're a monster. Ah, oh, she got you. We admit that she got you. Dr. Brooks. Hey, it's Hollow Earth guy. But he had to be in his 30s in Kong, which puts him in his 70s? OMG, Miles Dyson is 72. Okay, few things. First, I thought, all right, so the moths coming down are kind of like a reference to the fairies. They're even playing Yuji Koseki's Mothra tune again. Which, by the way, is an absolutely sensational update. But it was on my second time through that, and I'm a little embarrassed, but I know that there was at least a handful of you who must have missed it as well because it's never really spoken out loud and they're never seen together, but... Zhang Zi is playing twins, just like the fairies. This scene is only about three minutes later, but it's easy to miss it. This is Dr. Ling, the one we haven't seen yet. So they snuck the fairy twins in there after all. Also, yuppity yup yup yup, that's the prettiest thing you've seen and heard all day. You're second generation monarch. Third. Which is just occurring to me makes total sense. When you find out that all the myths and religious beliefs based on these giant creatures are real, you hire the experts. In this case, a bunch of twins. Excuse me, do you have something to add? Yeah, you're wrong. Honesty. We can't just sit here. I can't just sit down there. Ha, we still have some stuff in common. Another staggering entrance from Mothra. Shining like the sun, blowing the storm away. Sound design is killer. They even sampled Mothra's original Toho sounds. I'd be trying to save the thing that took my son. The only way to heal our wounds is to make peace with the demons who created them. You ever wonder if the line was like, yeah, well, sometimes bad things happen, you'll be all right. And Ken Watanabe said, what if I just say ad-lib a little poetry? You just make that up. No. 
I really did a fortune cookie once. More of that. <laughs> Just stumbling onto an underwater city while looking for a giant lizard. After going through some hollow earth tunnels. The rise of the titans. Roll credit. Um, missed opportunity. I got Zilla. I go. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> Appropriate reaction. Oh, we're just sacrificing our lives willy-nilly now? Is there anything the Vikings didn't get to first? At least he gets to see some cool sights on the way out. We know from the first movie that Serizawa's father gave him this watch and that it stopped when the first bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. So this is very literally Serizawa making peace with his demons by inverting the destruction and turning it into salvation for Godzilla. Serizawa gets to take that destructive power back. Bear McCreary can't stop creating delightful music that creates a monumental final journey for Serizawa. And when you consider the real meaning behind why the Japanese created Godzilla and its connection to nuclear warfare, this is literal and symbolic closure on multiple levels. Self-sacrifice. Ken Watanabe is always a win. Also, apparently this is Angiris. I see it. Spikes on the back. And... A reimagining of Akira Ifukube's Godzilla main title. Remember when I was like, whatever, we've seen it before. Yeah, I'm an idiot. I know how to find him! Mark has a turning point here where his concession to the fact that Godzilla is not incapable of benevolence, that in fact he shows respect and understanding, pulls the veil off his eyes so he can see that of course humans are the missing piece of the puzzle. Well, Serizawa, let him fight action. I used to love it when he said that. You're telling me. No, this time we join the fight. Somebody was listening to Serizawa. What part will we play? Gravity beams have really never looked so dangerous, and even if you're just thinking, cool, electric breath, it totally works as something fun and different. <laughs> Can't blame her. Sometimes that works for Eleven. <laughs> Didn't miss this time. <laughs> Technically, I asked for Godzilla to drift with Jaegers, but this works. Last time the humans were helpful, but mostly trying to stay out of the way. Solidifying our boy as a good one is very satisfying. I'll admit, that didn't get the most likely intended reaction out of me when I saw it in the trailer the first time. But it's got an old school Godzilla feel to it, and even if I chuckled a little, I was still pretty hyped. Now it's pretty epic and makes more sense since I know Godzilla is all radiated up. Ah, brutal. Finally that human perspective that made the scale of the first movie so impressive. Speaking of the first movie, talk to the tail. Oof, that's brutal. Godzilla is so nuked it only takes a few seconds to charge up a considerable blast. <laughs> yes, Godzilla's atomic eyes lighting up his reflection in the building. <laughs> Mothra to the re well, not rescue, but aid. And more hints that Dr. Chen has some kind of connection with Mothra. Rodan is usually on the good guys team, so I expect some sour faces, but 3v1 wouldn't be nearly as much fun as tag team. Just constantly taking the epicness to new levels in this finale. Frank Castle levels are brutal. <laughs> At least now they know they could use Ghidorah as a giant battery if needed. But that's another killer combo. <laughs> Butt stab sneak attack. <gasps> Maddie's alive. That's cold, or actually hot, since Godzilla was apparently up high enough and has enough mass to heat up on re-entry, meaning King Ghidorah dropped him from space. And this score, a perfect mix of, wow, that's an amazing sight with, not my boy. <laughs> Who knew one terrifying monster protecting another terrifying monster could be so emotional? And even though there was no possible way Mothra was making it out alive, this is another director getting me to feel sympathy for a bug. A big bug, but a bug. Ew, moth dust. I mean, aw, Mothra healing dust. And self-sacrifice to save Godzilla. More self-sacrifice mirroring the other queen in this movie. Long live the king. Hell yes. A car is melting into puddles, and you can hear the tail charge up before you see it. Also, burning Godzilla! <sighs> Just 
in case you weren't sure, Godzilla went burning Godzilla because of the combination of the nuke and Mothra. You can see her wings in the nuclear pulse and even hear her posthumous screech. Face meltingly brutal. Ooh, that fake out. Also brutal. Oh man. So these guys were just standing by waiting to see who came out on top. Bunch of lazy titans. Even the Muto knows her place now. Again, ending on Godzilla. No next day, just heat king. See, I know you were all yelling at me when I was complaining about Emma's speech. She's the bad guy. But this entire credit sequence is a what if humans did die off in astronomical numbers and also there are giant kaiju just hanging out. The Sahara would bloom, coral reefs would all come back, ice sheets would stop melting. Like, fine, it's a fantasy movie, but I think we're skipping a few steps here concerning radiation. But also, whatever. These credits are like a bunch of movies jumping forward. If they stick to these credits as canon, I'm pretty excited for where they go. Would you believe that this is the first time Blue Oyster Cult's song has been used in a Godzilla movie? And at first I thought, cool, Blue Oyster Cult. And then, no, that that sounds like, that's Serge Tankian. This remix cover, whatever you wanna call it, is epic. Even incorporating the Gojira Matsuda chanting from earlier. And he promptly flipped it because cruise ships create a crap ton of emissions and pollution. I, I don't make the rules, that's just what happens. He's the Earth's white blood cell king. It's still a funny sentiment that after a few, what, months? Seeing Godzilla is like a whale watch. Oh boy, you show me Mecha Godzilla in this universe and we've already got Jaegers, get Charlie Hunnam back, let's do this. And who's not super hyped for this? And good news, they'll have someone to fight. More good news, Mothra ain't gone forever. It's always nice to see studios use the people who lived it in real life, you know? Here's what all the redacted credits say if you're interested. It's basically the history of what happened, but it can be hard to follow since it's broken up like this. I'll actually put it in the description since this is also probably hard to read. Sets up some possible things in the future. Either way, it's impressive that they chose to hide an entire story in something most people would probably never see. These are some of my favorite types of movies to cover on this channel. This spread between the critics and audience score was initially the only type of film I planned on doing when I started this channel. Then everyone requested Deadpool and promptly made it go viral, so I unrestricted my list. But I still look forward to these. Alita was one, one of the widest spreads I've ever seen is gone in 60 seconds, so you know I'll be on that one. But King of the Monsters illustrates the disconnect that sometimes exists. Rotten Tomatoes has this critics consensus at the top of the score sheet. Cutting edge effects are still no substitute for a good story, obviously. Obviously that's true, just not always for monster movies, especially Godzilla movies. The first one did better at the box office, had a higher critic rating and a lower audience score. Go figure. There are lots and lots of factors that determine all of these things, from top build actors to being a sequel to cultural timing to the weather. But they put a bunch of well-known kaiju on screen, called them by name and had them fight. That's the Godzilla bar for a lot of people, myself included, and say okay. Don't get me wrong, bigger, faster, louder doesn't necessarily mean better. I prefer 2014 for myriad reasons. I said in that video that I enjoyed the cutaways from the monster fights because it built up the tension and by the end you're just itching for that final battle and it feels like this enormous payoff. I really enjoyed the fights in this movie, but I will say that I wasn't nearly as excited for any of them. The final battle ends just about as over the top as 2014, but I wasn't quite as enthralled. There's also no airport entrance moment in this movie. That slow crane up on Godzilla after his glass shaking step. Close, but not much will ever compare to that moment. We did eventually get a few we just can't fit it in frame set pieces. I think partly because they had a lot of monsters to get through, they didn't take the same time with each that we got in 2014. The first step out of the Muto is another epic moment that is never really felt in this movie. Maybe I'm just really into stepping. We do get the occasional low angle from the ground point of view, but it's missing some of the reverence. A large part of that is the remote locations and lack of a threat to civilians. The only time we get anything substantial in that regard is with Rodan and he just flies over, not really interacting with the innocents. None of these things soured my experience at all, it only matters in comparison. One issue with breakneck movies with tons of action bouncing around from set piece to set piece is that a scene like this, arguably one of the prettier scenes in the film, can sort of just slip past you unless you're really focused. That's one benefit of holding back. This is a moment to take a breath and enjoy the stellar score. There's so much going on. And I might venture that King of the Monsters actually has more beautiful wides. The scale is elevated and we get moments to take in the majesty of these creatures. It's a gorgeous film, some really iconic set pieces and shots that stick with you. Everything is technically first rate. Just following Godzilla along in the ocean, even Ghidorah trapped in ice behind the bridge is just 
pretty. A lot of care went into this movie from sound design and score to composition and visual effects. You've probably seen this behind the scenes clip of the mocap reference for Ghidorah. That speaks to effort. They're full CG characters and alien dragons at that. Modelers and animators can make up the rules as they go if they want. But using humans as reference allows them to ground the creatures and makes them feel present as if they could exist. I picked on the main message enough. The one that interests me is the one that takes place between Sarazawa and Mark. It sort of ends up a little hammy because solving the riddle takes precedence, but this was a very human moment. Not to use a variation on a word that half of you will instantly hate, but Mark sort of wakes up right here. He didn't see Godzilla as anything more than a destructive predator, only being willing to save him as a means to an end. Mark understands animals and knows how to interact with them, but when Godzilla looked into his soul, he realized he'd been wrong. Challenging our preconceptions is very difficult, but you'll often find that very little is as black and white as you thought. I'm here for that message all day. And the movie isn't storyless, it just often takes a back seat. But the parallels drawn between Emma and Mothra and the relationship and the character growth from Sarazawa and Mark is well put together. And I'm excited for Godzilla vs. Kong next year. Next week I'll only have a 60 second review, and then the week after, this is a cryptic frame because I'm not 100% positive I'm gonna do this movie that week or not. So if you get it, no I might have to put it off. Either way, see you next week. Ooh.